On this episode of Athletic Training Chat, we have Zach Turner, which if you are on Twitter, you have probably come across something that he's done, uh, but something that Zach has been into early on in his career is a lot of reading and looking at different books and ideas and how to apply them to his AT practice and just generally life and how to go about different things. Really good discussion. Um, I know I picked up a couple more books. Also an avid reader. It took me about till grad school to really get it and then go beyond there. Um, but definitely learning quite a bit and applying different things to it. So really interesting discussion here. Um, as always, we are powered by Mueller Sports Medicine. If you're heading out to NATA, stop by, see them. We really wish we could be out there this year, uh, but unfortunately not um, due to some other family circumstances, but we're looking forward to getting together with anybody. But they would love to see us, show you what they've got coming out, uh, what's new, and also just take any ideas that you have. So be sure to say hi to everybody there. And without that, without further ado, please enjoy this episode. Welcome to this episode of Athletic Training Chat. We are on with Zach Turner. Uh, been following Zach on Twitter for quite a while. He's done all kinds of different things, but most recently um, has started kind of the AT Book Club community on Twitter, which is kind of the topic that we're going to talk about today. Um, Zach, from everything I've seen and we'll get into, it, is an avid reader. Uh, I am myself as well. Uh, and so we were just going to talk about how that has impacted him as a professional and also as a person and really focusing on books that aren't, you know, therapeutic modalities or this type of rehabilitation and uh, the things that, you know, we read um, to enhance our direct skills. But before we get into all that, I'm going to turn it over to Zach to fill in some of his background um, and where he's at. And then we'll jump into kind of that topic. Yep. Thanks again, Joel, for reaching out to finally get me on your amazing podcast after all these years of exchanging reading and um, other athletic training ideas online uh, past couple of years. Um, good, to, good to bounce some ideas off of you. Um, for any of the listeners who don't know who I am, um, my name is Zach. Um, I'm, I'm best known on Twitter for cracking jokes um, making people laugh, um, this, that, the other, um, I've been working in the division one college setting for all three years of my athletic training certification. Um, uh, most recently been holding down the fort at the university of Cincinnati as an assistant athletic trainer, uh, with direct care for the track and field and cross country teams. Uh, it's not everyone's favorite, um, but in, in my world, it's kind of something I've started to master, started to appreciate, and I really love what I do and who I work with. Uh, I've spent my grad school and several years of my early career in that and um, would potentially go back if it wasn't so much travel. The travel is what I think would kill me because the season just never ends. Anyway, um, kind of first question when we're talking about this and we're going to dive into kind of maybe some specific books and um Zach had sent some ones that have really had um an impact on him but have you always been into reading I haven't I actually kind of did not fully appreciate the uh the language arts and the uh the English classes that I took in undergrad or even high school um I picked up reading and I kind of had an itch to start doing it um, around my grad school days. And, you know, I, I graduated in December, 2020, first day of January. Um, I, I start picking up books as kind of my filler hobby, um, just something new. Um, learning was always kind of been exhilarating for me and seeing fresh perspectives and just one after another, I, I, started to become a reader. Um, my goal going into 
that 2021 year was to read just one book a month, 12 books. And December came around. And even though I had been working almost full time in that, that period, um, I still had doubled my goal. And uh, it's just kind of just been a really good, healthy hobby for me. And I love sharing it with other people too, um, because I consider myself a, a lifelong learner. Absolutely. No, I'm with you there. I think I had a semester off between undergrad and grad and my brother and I were trying to start some little hobby business and started getting into reading and then it was business books and that just morphed into um, going on beyond there. Uh, you mentioned, you know, you, your goal was 12 books, you got up to 24. How do you go about picking the books that you do read. Um, I know we kind of alluded to in the beginning, you know, the ones that we'll probably highlight are definitely not, one I think was, it's related to medicine um, with many other layers to it, but uh, actually a couple of them are. The other ones, not so much, but um, how do you go about picking the books that you're checking out? Are they always improvement kind of leadership based or what's your spectrum here? Yeah, definitely with an overwhelming um, bias, I definitely pick um, nonfiction literature. It's definitely my realm. Um, and then from about there, about half of it veers off down the medicine or um, current, um, current events. And then the other one kind of goes into your leadership, self-improvement, perspective kind of stuff and I've even started kind of reading some older philosophy texts as well just because it's something I appreciate in another very different world to learn from. So going and looking at a few of them um, you got Ryan Holiday on there twice I will be the first to admit I've only read Ego as the Enemy although I have all his other books on my list uh, just have not gotten through them. Uh, so is, you have ego is the enemy, the obstacle is the way, and extreme ownership. And I'm going to kind of group those into uh, just their own little group of three. What has reading those books done to impact you both personally and professionally? Yeah, I would say all three of those books, I would also group together because they're ones that I'm going to hopefully try to continue to read multiple times, like maybe once a sure. year or so. Um, they offer really good perspectives of the lessons you learn and the humility that you need to deal with said lessons. Um, they all are pretty good texts in terms of learning from history, learning from mistakes, um, in applying these lessons. And when I read these books, all three of them, I think of maybe superiors or coaches or coworkers and how we probably could have communicated better or I could have probably made a better image of myself and handled something better. And so I'm always trying to use my own experiences when I'm reading texts like these um, because I, you know, I feel like there are people I might work with past and present who maybe, maybe put up a wall that's a little bit built on ego or pride when really they just need to start with a bridge of humility. I think that's such a key point And one that's big for me too, is, you know, taking things, if you haven't read Extreme Ownership or you haven't listened to this and heard us talk to Rick Cox, who is a Jacko Willink super fan, um, and he'll be okay that we say that. Um, the whole concept of the book is, you know, it all comes back onto you. And I feel like Ego is the Enemy is very, very similar in that regard. I just remember that one. It just felt like it was calling me out in the best way possible with every you know page that I read. It was just like, wow. Um, so I think, you know, that self-reflection bit is so important. Have you been able to take those lessons and apply them, especially in your setting that I, I can relate to a degree because I've been in that one, but 
division one high level activity there there's a lot of ego and part of it is that's needed and necessary how have you best applied those maybe even specifically like working relationships with athletes patients and coaches absolutely um i definitely try to keep a lot of le- the lessons i've learned in mind again with uh dealing especially with coaches and athletes and trying to you know recognize that i'm not the most experienced person but also stand up for everything i'm responsible for and everything i've learned um you know kind of like i wouldn't give a a an athlete a sport based lesson i probably wouldn't appreciate much if a coach had tried to make a decision medically without um, my consent. Um, so I think I, the one setback or the, um, the one kind of kicker with books like these is that the people who really need to read them aren't reading them. Um, the, the people with the big egos or the people who think they don't do anything wrong aren't reading these self-improvement books. They're not checking their ego. Um, so I take these books as kind of a learning a new language and learning how I can best manage some of these people I've worked with or see how I can better understand where they're coming from and not, you know, puffing my chest back up at them, but rather coming back down to that level of humility and just focusing on the goal at hand, I guess. That's a great point. I think that was something I posted when I kind of showed, you know, I had read Ego is the Enemy. And if you sit there and go think, ah, I don't need that book. It is the book you most definitely need to read, um, no matter who you are. Uh, even if you think you're the most humble person in the world, it, it is still um, an eye-opening one in that regard. Uh, Curious about the other two books and wanted to start off with Better by uh, Dr. Atul Gawande. I uh, love his stuff. Um, I actually read Checklist Manifesto before I read Better uh, and Checklist Manifesto was very eye-opening for me as well. But what did you take from the book when it says Better? That, that is a wide open <laughs> um, topic and book title that could mean all kinds of things. Yeah, you get the perspective of, again, someone who is a a medical doctor who's trained his way up and been patient and worked his way near to the top, working at Massachusetts General Hospital. And he still not only takes time in his day to write, but to reflect on how he can be better at what he does and how people in his own field can be better and He has multiple examples, multiple stories. Um, I'd recommend any of his four or five books that he's written in that regard. Um, But again, I'm I'm all about self-improvement and having the humility to admit that we can always get better. Um, It was an easy pick of a book as I've read all of his other ones. Sure. Um, That's another... um on the list to get through his other ones. What about the book black man in a white coat? One I have not read. Um, definitely added it to the Amazon wish list um, when you sent it, but what impact or what did you learn from reading that one? Yeah, that was a very good choice for me. Um, as a, as a white male, I got to read from Dr. Damon Tweedy about his experiences of race conflict and medicine and his experiences with having to treat the historically black areas that were impoverished and the difference in care that they got in the quality of care and the access to resources when compared to perhaps the white middle class who got seen quicker got different or better treatment. And he even experienced um, racism in white patients who refused to be seen by him. So I think it is a great 
book for anyone in the health professions who will work, um, will work with diverse patients, people who will work with diverse healthcare professionals, people who are diverse healthcare professionals. So um, that was another book that when talking about trying to be better, trying to see a different perspective, that's probably another one that you should really read. This is kind of a large philosophical question, but curious as to your take of it, you know, we all view the world through our own perspective and you reference, you know, you're a white male, you know, in the profession, obviously I am as well. How do you go about trying to take a larger view, you know, like reading a book like that from a different perspective, obviously something I've never experienced and I can't speak for you, but sounds like you haven't necessarily experienced any of that as well. But like, how do you try and take a step back to learn lessons from it as you just referenced? Absolutely. Um, It's, you know, it's unfortunate that, you know, things like skin color, gender, sex can um, make people perceive you differently, not take you as seriously. Um, And people might make up what they think your background or history is. And that's where the prejudice starts to become a barrier and toxic to the medical professional and patient relationship, especially. Um, I'm able to use some of my own experiences, my own diversity to dial back and appreciate the differences that some of my own patients have. Um, I might not be of a diverse um, ethnicity. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm Caucasian, but when some of my athletes say, you know, I was only raised by a single parent, I can say me too. Some of my kids say, you know, my, my parents died at a young age, I can say me too. So a lot of my patients are poor, don't get regular health care. And I can say, you know, me too, growing up. And so in a way, um, diversity is not just, um, you know, skin color, uh, diversity also includes your background. So with that in mind, I am able to better appreciate and have a little bit more empathy for my patients who haven't always had it easy. Appreciate you sharing that. What books are on the reading list moving forward? Are there any ones that you're Yeah. Um, I usually buy in chunks and I'll admit that my favorite source of books is to go to my local bookstore and scope them out and then buy them off of Amazon for about half the price. Yeah. yeah, Um, yeah. So some of the books that, uh, I just got in would be the Enid, which is written by Virgil. It's a ancient, like poetry kind of text okay. from way, way, way back. Um, I got this book that I've seen floating around online called Aikigai. And it's a, a Japanese book about kind of like the pursuit of happiness. And then I got a book called Start With Why, which is another kind of self-improvement book. Um, I always try to kind of mix in different types of books not just stay on one subject all year long so for sure I can completely understand that um for you and because I think everybody does this a little differently how do you best retain what you're what you've got from reading a book do you you know do you read it and you just internalize it really well how do you go about doing that are you you know do you scribble all over it Uh, how do you pull that information out yeah, absolutely. Um, so for the books that I read, um, as I'm reading, I will, um, what I'll do is I will, you know, underline in pen, any quote, any paragraph, any sentence that I really enjoy. And then I'll mark the top of that page with a little sticky note tab. It looks like about a quarter slice of an actual sticky note. Okay. And That way I can always go back later, or if I want to do some writing of my own, 
or maybe I feel like I need to beef up my Twitter feed with some good quotes, I will open those books to those pages and stuff. So I'm big on marking up the pages, um, giving a nice tattoo and then marking it for later reference. Um, my hope is that when I go back to reread some of these books that I can find more things to appreciate. Absolutely. No, I like that one a lot um, and going about doing it that way. Mm -hmm. What else haven't we covered around reading just in reading just in, in general and how you've been able to apply it um, to your career as an athletic trainer so far? Yeah, I think when, you know, I, I discuss among colleagues or coworkers, you know, that it's a passion of mine or they always see a new book on my desk at work. They say, Oh, I don't have time. It's kind of like the working out hobby. It's like, if it's important sure. to you, um, you'll make time for it is my biggest advice. Um, I've said this before and I'll say it again, that just 30 minutes a day of reading can change your life. And it's not like working out where you have to do that every day, but if you want to invest in a new habit, um, I think that's the one, um, I would say between that and a little bit of home gardening, those are my two like money-based hobbies that I really, um, budget for is being able to, um, take care of my plants and to grow my book collection. I can appreciate that. Anything else that you'd like to cover before we hop into the AT chat questions? Uh, not really. <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Um, first question. I'm kind of curious on this one, especially since you, you've been in the profession for three years now uh, that you were saying is where do you see it going in the next five to 10 years? I honestly see myself probably settling back into um, a research position or maybe a physician extender or orthopedic outreach. Um, I'm a huge advocate for our profession, um, but seeing just like the recent, uh, you know, as of, you know, June, 2022, we're seeing so many college jobs stay open for the fact that administration, PT companies, et cetera, don't understand our value, don't understand the work we do in our hours, and we're grossly underpaid. Um, and for someone like me who has um, tried to advocate for a salary increase that is reasonable, at, right now I am making 19000 below the national average, the regional average, the, the college average and someone working with one to five years of experience and a master's degree, again, severely under average with no wiggle room for my administrators. Um, I think the best thing I can do as an advocate is go somewhere and find a career that understands what we do and can give me a little bit of wiggle room and uh, really, really understand what we do and how important our work is. So I see myself settling into a role that can make me maybe a little bit more financially stable um, or more reasonable hours. I will say, if you can't advocate for your salary, ad advocate for your time next um, when you should be advocating for both. Um, I also think I will probably go back to school at some point, maybe pursue another degree. Um, might be my next hobby. There you go. Yeah, I think it can be extremely frustrating in any setting with salary, but um, in that large Division One university setting, it is even more frustrating because there seemingly is more than enough money to go around. I saw a post earlier that like half a billion dollars were paid out in um, – basically settle and I don't know what the right word is for coaches getting fired and like ultimately what they were owed for getting fired. And like the fact that that money can be picked up and nobody really bats an eye at it. And yet we struggle to adequately pay professionals is, is 
perplexing to say the least. Yeah. I think uh, when I saw those graphics floating around about um, only 1% of yeah. all division one, uh, you know, budgetary expenses, only 1% are going to sports medicine or athlete health care. I thought, okay, that's probably an exaggeration. And, you know, sure enough, I opened up this actual study that was cited and their investigation of the NCAA from division one, two, and three and schools that have FCS football to FBS and those types of programs as well. The numbers remain true and consistent that the, the sports medicine side of things are severely cut and swept under the rug. You know, I think, I think schools spend more on their, the snacks they hand out in the weight room than they do their sports medicine staff sometimes. Yep. It's a fascinating world. Second question. Um, we'll go with it. Even as a young athletic trainer, what advice would you go back and give yourself as even maybe a younger athletic trainer? If you could set maybe this go back to when you were a student or, you know, pre-grad school, if you could just let us know when you would go back and give that advice and what it would be. Yep. I definitely wish I would have been given a, um, a secondary school rotation in undergrad so I could fully appreciate what some of my best friends are doing. And when I want to complain about my college job or all this, I just think about how many athletes and coaches and administrators my secondary school counterparts often work with. So sure. I also wish at a, at a younger age while I was completing my education and considering my um, future that I might have made my academic curriculum a little bit more flexible and open to other pathways such as physical therapy, or maybe a little bit more research, or maybe even a pre-med pathway in there as well, um, just so that I don't close myself off to future opportunities. Makes sense. What has been the most influential resource you have found thus far in your career? Are you thinking man-made resource? Are you thinking? It is, it is your question to answer, whatever, wherever you want to go. I would say the most useful resource that I have had in my career has probably been just talking to physicians, physical therapists, other equally passionate athletic trainers and when there's a topic I want to ask about being able to have a conversation. Um, when I'm having a certain injury pattern with my athlete population, the first thing I do is text another one or two college athletic trainers working track and field and being like, are you seeing this? Um, how are you treating that? What does your strength and conditioning program look like for this group? Because we are really struggling with this on the back end of our season. So being able to not only reach out to and network with other athletic trainers and be humble enough to recognize that I don't have all the answers, um, equally having people feel comfortable reaching out to me with their questions has been invaluable for my growth as well. Awesome. Probably have already kind of answered this question, but I'm going to ask, ask it anyway. As an AT in your role, how do you take care of yourself? Well, um, I used to have daily goals where I was like, I need to work out for at least 30 minutes a day. I, need, I want to read 30 minutes a day, and I want to do some sort of learning, maybe looking at a research topic for 30 minutes a day. And I realized that goals of those marks don't necessarily mean you learn or got better or use that time well. And so I just stay mindful of my daily routine to recognize that if I feel like doing something and I feel like I need some self-care, if I need to hit the weight room, I do. And uh, 
again, I do read most days, but the gym, not so much. Um, so I, I've come to learn and accept that if you are doing something just to check it off a list, maybe it doesn't need to be on your list. Um, so if I feel like I need to hit the gym and it makes me happy, then I absolutely am going to go do that. I'm going to look forward to it that day, but dragging myself in there doesn't improve my well being. I like that. If you could change or eliminate one thing, could be a modality, a common practice, a mindset, or something of your choosing in the field of athletic training, what would it be? I'm getting rid of ice bags and ice in general. Yeah. Um, I see too many people utilize it for the wrong thing. I see too many clinicians. And even doctors still saying it reduces inflammation and giving improper patient education. Um, it is overvalued. And I always tell my kids before you hop in the, the cold tub or the contrast or the Normatec boots, I'm saying you better be getting your seven to nine hours of sleep. You better be getting your 90 to 130 ounces of water every day. You better be, you know, eating well and better be training well. So, um, I definitely would probably get rid of the, the ice bags because they just aren't giving, they're not giving people what they think it's giving them in an essence. Absolutely. Uh, that has been, that has come up more than once. Um, uh, I think for good reason. Last question. Uh, what does being an athletic trainer mean to you? Oh, it means so much to me, and I'm kind of grateful to be working among, you know, future Olympians, um, current world team members, um, elite level athletes who not only trust me to carry out their, their medical care and kind of be their, their primary point of contact for any aches and pains, but also to be able to have inside jokes with them, to be able to ask about their family and them appreciate that and them to care about me outside of what I do as well and ask about my family just means the world. Um, that would be one of the things I would miss if I were ever to leave my setting or this profession in general is the relationships I've built with my athletes and some of the jokes we have and um, just the way that we're able to interact and still achieve our goals is something that you might not be able to find in a clinic. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the first hype person for my athletes, but I also from a professional level need to make sure they're, they're doing what I need them to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will always value the relationships and the doors that is opened by coming into this profession. Well said. Absolutely. Um, kind of to wrap up, if people wanted to follow you, uh, you reference cracking jokes on Twitter, which I can attest to that you have some pretty clever stuff um, or connect with you. What would be the best places for people to do that? And we'll link, uh, link it all up in the show notes. Yeah, I would say in terms of the, the athletic training population and where I am found most often in regards to social media, connecting and networking. Um, I would ask people to follow my Twitter if you aren't already. Um, my at is turnbomb15, T-U-R-N-B-O-M-B-1-5. -B and that's on Twitter. Perfect. I appreciate you taking the time uh, and discussing something that is related to athletic training, but not directly. Uh, but I think that's important as well. So appreciate you taking the time to do so. Yeah, Joel, thanks for having me on and uh, taking the time to and have some really good questions for me. So I appreciate it. Of course. Thank you for listening to this episode of Athletic Training Chat. We really appreciate it and hope you enjoyed it. Picked up some new books to read from this. If you could, either on Spotify or iTunes or wherever you are, 
give us a rating. Let us know how we're doing. Please leave a review. Also, if you check out athletictrainingchat.com, we'll have a link for feedback, things that you want to hear, people maybe you want to see interviewed so we can just get more and highlight more of the profession. Uh, that's ultimately what we're out to do. So please let us know. Uh, we want to thank Mueller again. We just filled our second Throw a Lifeline program. Thank you to all those that contributed, either by listening or monetary donation. Eternally grateful. We're hoping to get more of those out. We're already off to a good start on round three. So with that, we'll talk to you next time.